vision. Welcome to the D list, the show where I list things and my name begins with a D. Oh, like the letter your name begins with is so damn special. If you're anything like me, one of the reasons you love television is because you often relate to the characters and situations on your favorite shows. And you probably like to discuss your favorite shows with your friends and maybe even discuss how much certain things in your life remind you of your favorite shows and vice versa. But of course for years nobody on TV shows would ever talk about how much their life was like a TV show because that would just be stupid. But nowadays everybody's a geek and media savviness is the new media casual awareness so the past decade or so has seen a massive influx in fictional characters who relate more to the characters who are fictional within their worlds than to the other characters who are real within their worlds. So here are a few of my favorite fictional characters who wish they were fictional characters. That's not confusing. Number 5. Barney Stinson from How I Met Your Mother. If there's one word Barney wanted to use to describe his life, it was legend, wait for it. And I hope you're not lactose intolerant because the second half of that word is dairy. And sometimes his life was indeed awesome. Other times it was rather pathetic, but eh, he's a master of deep denial. Are you singing a song about yourself? Absolutely not. That would be lame. When his life wasn't awesome enough, he tried to force it to be awesome. Now, sometimes that involved generating a massive adventure for him and his friends, but far more often it just involved him making up elaborate stories to provide a false sense of significance. And it especially involved him trying to force cinematic moments into mundane situations. I've been waiting for you. Wait a second, that's not our chair. Did you bring that chair yourself? I needed one that swivels. And call him I will. He's gonna say it again really slow. Call him I will. Any time a girl wants to solve her father issues through promiscuity and binge drinking, we will be there. Good day. <laughs> You're just waiting for me to speak so you can enter. I said good day! Which of course led to him being hilariously overdramatic over the most innocuous scenario. Love it. Hold on. Love it. I hate it. What? Why? 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 Let me tell it. In the hands of a lesser performer, this could just be stupid, but man, NPH can sell anything. Nothing and everything is possible. Number 4, Jake Peralta from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I'm not becoming like them. I am them. Hey, what are you doing, weirdo? I'm doing the best speech from Donnie Brasco. Jake is a good detective, but he's lazy as all get out, and he's stuck in a state of perpetual adolescence. Slam! That was a slam! While he does manage to solve many cases, and he loves being a cop, he's completely uninterested in the boring paperwork-filled day-to-day life and much more interested in the glamorous action of cop movies. Die Hard is the best cop movie of all time. One cop heroically saving the day while everyone else stands around and watches. It's the story of my life. And he can't resist trying to inject the mundane parts of his day with a little bit of fictional cop style. Fine. Here's my gun and my badge. I don't need those. You're not suspended yet, you're on administrative leave. Never let me do anything cool! And when he runs out of fictional cops, there's the plethora of other fictional people he tries to be. When he goes undercover, he always has an elaborate fictional persona at the ready. Say hello to Harvey Norgenbloom, CPA, recently divorced father of two with a dark sexual secret. I'll play Detective Bart Farley, tightly wound, hates violence against animals, and you're my partner, Gerald Jimes, a man who solved every crime but one, the murder of his wife. My name is Duncan Buck. I was raised on an oil rig by 90 men and one prostitute. Even living his dream job, he still leaps at the chance to escape into a fantasy life, especially if he gets to live the extra fantasy of espionage. Number 3. Michael Scott from NBC's The Office. Michael considers himself a student of comedy and seems to be somewhat aware that he's living in a sitcom. He just doesn't realize he's the butt of the joke. 
In the original Office, one of David Brent's defining traits was his desire to be a performer. And Michael inherited this, but he took it a step further. He wanted to live in a performance. In his mind, he cast his boring employees as a ragtag family of misfits. Which was ludicrous until they actually became a ragtag family of misfits. And he cast himself as the protagonist. And he too was constantly chasing those cinematic moments. I'm king of the world! You complete me. And you can hug it out, bitch. Not only because he loved movies and TV, but because he knew so little of the real world that he didn't know any other way. I'm going to give you a piece of paper. I want you to write down how much you want, and I want you to slide it back across the desk to me. Why can't I just tell you? Because that is the way these things are done in films. One thing he does know for sure, he needs to learn a lesson at the end of each episode, and he very rarely learns the right one. I learned something. I don't want somebody sucking up to me because they think I am going to help their career. I want them sucking up to me because they genuinely love me. Hmm. Number two, Sean Spencer from Psych. Man, a lot of these characters come from Universal shows. I guess even their own characters love to ride the movies. There's a movie? Sean's another brilliant but lazy detective, perhaps even lazier than Jake. He's never had any training, beyond being raised by a strict cop. He just sort of fell into detective work by noticing things. And when asked how he solved cases, it was easier to just claim to be psychic than to explain how hyper-observant he really is. Granted, his observational skills are practically supernatural to begin with, but in being a slacker, he has very little patience for reality, and instead, he relates everything to pop culture. I lived in an airport for a month, Gus. That was Tom Hanks in the terminal. Same difference. This is just like collateral. So I'm Jamie Foxx, and you're Tom Cruise. You're Cruise. It's a chance to go undercover in high school, a la 21 Jump Street. Obviously, I'm Johnny Depp. Sadly, you can only pass for Holly Robbins. Why can't I be Richard Grieco? Why would you want to be Richard Grieco? No matter how irrelevant or inappropriate the timing of the pop culture reference. I'd say that's pretty ridiculous. Though not as ridiculous as Denise Richards playing a nuclear physicist named Christmas Jones in a Bond movie. <laughs> and the cases often give him ample opportunity to try and live out a fiction, casting himself as everything from Indiana Jones to a superhero. <laughs> Kidding. We all know it, let's all say it together. Abed Nadir from Community. What did we discuss? No voiceover, I'm sorry. It is kind of a crutch. Ha! A show not owned by Universal. Even if it was shown on NBC for the first five years of its life. Abed has come to define the idea of a genre savvy character, a character who knows exactly what type of show he's on and what sorts of tropes and stories he's about to live. Will they or won't they? Sexual tension. Abed, it makes the group uncomfortable when you talk about us like we're characters in a show you're watching. Well, that's sort of my gimmick. But we did lean on that pretty hard last week. I can lay low for an episode. In the second episode of the show, he remarks on how much the beginning of the scene was like the beginning of a television scene. And how unlike a television character it is to notice similarities to television, even though in real life many of us do it all the time. And that was pretty much the moment I knew I was madly in love with this show. Abed was the ambassador between a TV-savvy audience and the world within the TV show, translating the relationships and events around him into the familiar television archetypes. TV makes sense. It has structure, logic, rules, and likable leading men. Of course, Abed's not the only one at Greendale who wishes his life was a piece of media, so it's not uncommon for circumstances to come along where Abed is completely prepared. Like, superhero level prepared. Predictable but appetizing! But Community is also not afraid to show the dark side of his inability to comprehend or relate to the real world. Did you take Annie's pen to make life more like Benny Hill or whatever you do? I wouldn't do that. I hate bottle episodes. They're wall to wall facial expression and emotional nuance. I might as well sit in the corner with a bucket on my head. Abed's strengths and weaknesses are all too relatable, and at any moment they can be a celebration or a cautionary tale. Relating to fiction is great, but it's not an adequate substitute for relating to real people. And sadly, relating to real people is something Abed just couldn't do. 
Every time he tried, he had to filter it through his relationship to a movie or TV show. Abed is simultaneously one of the most tragic and one of the most delightfully fun characters on television, and that's why we all love him. Those of us who relate to fictional characters will probably especially relate to fictional characters who relate to other fictional characters. So, who are some of your favorite fictional characters who don't think they're quite fictional enough yet? Let me know in the comments, and I need to go lie down. Thank <laughs> you.